Hello and welcome to another audiobook. Uh, today we are beginning uh, 1.35 a.m. So I've already done Room for One More and The New Kid, which are the two other stories in this book, but I haven't yet done 1.35 a.m. So we're going to begin that today. Um, I have already read this one, so I do know what the ending is, um, and I, I know what the story is like. Um, as you can see, I've highlighted a lot. <laughs> it's just for my notes, really. Um, I go over, I highlight every story, uh, just the key parts so that um, I get a good understanding of it when I go through it again, and there's key, key lore points and stuff. Um, but this is one of the, good, the one of the good things about having a Kindle reader, you know. Uh, I, I wouldn't highlight a paperback book, you know. So, we're going to be beginning this today, um, and hopefully you enjoy. I did enjoy this story, I think it's quite good. Uh, again, it 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 takes a while to get into it, but once you get into it, uh, it it's really good. So, let's begin. Oh yeah, the other thing is, uh, there's this old woman, and no... I'm not going to spoil it, but there's this old woman who sings a lot, so I'm going to I'm going to try and do some voice acting too. Um, wish me luck. <laughs> oh hooray, buzzy buzzy buzzy! Sang a loud, tinkling voice. The inane song reached like a long-handled hook into Delilah's enjoyable dream and yanked her from the blessed retreat of sleep. What the? Delilah muttered as she sat up in the middle of her rumpled flannel sheets blinking at the sun punching through gaps in her louvred blinds. You make me so... You make me feel so perky, the singer continued. Delilah threw her pillow at the inadequate wall that separated her apartment from the one next door. The pillow made a satisfying thump when it hit a framed poster depicting a serene beachy scene. Delilah looked at the poster with longing. It, re it represented the view she wished she had. But Delilah didn't have an ocean view. She had a view of dumpsters and the filthy backside of the 24-hour diner where she worked. She didn't have serenity either. She had her annoying neighbour, Mary, who continued to sing at the top of her lungs, Thank you, thank you, thank you for starting my day. Who sings about alarm clocks? Delilah snapped, groaning and rubbing her eyes. It was bad enough having a singing neighbour. It was a thousand times worse than a singing neighbour that the singing neighbour made her up her own stupid songs and always started her day with one about an alarm clock. Weren't alarm clocks bad enough on their own? Speaking of which, Delilah looked at her clock. What? She catapulted from her bed. Grabbing the little bit battery powered um, digital clock, Delilah glared at its face, which read 6.25am. What good are you? Delilah demanded, tossing the clock onto her bright blue comforter. Delilah had a pathological hatred of alarm clocks. It was a vestige of the ten months she spent in her last foster home nearly five years before, but life in the real world required use of them, something Delilah was still learning to deal with, though now she'd discovered something she hated worse than alarm clocks, alarm clocks that didn't work. Delilah's phone rang. When she picked it up, she didn't wait for the caller to speak. Talking over the sound of clattering plates and a hum of voices, she said, I know, Nate, I overslept. I can be there in 30 minutes. I already called in Ryan to cover. You can take her to a clock shift. Delilah sighed. sighed. She hated that shift. It was the really busy one. Actually, she hated all the shifts. She hated shifts, period. As a shift manager at the diner, she was expected to work whichever shift best fit the overall schedule. So, her days varied from 6 to 2, 2 to 10, and 10 to 6. Her body clock was so messed up that she was practically sleeping while she was awake and awake while she was sleeping. She lived in a state of perpetual exhaustion. Her mind was always murky, like fog had rolled in through her ears. Not only did the fog dampen her ability to think clearly, it also made it difficult for her brain to interface with her senses. It seemed as though to her vision, hearing and taste buds were always a little off. Delilah, can I count on you to be here at two? Nate barked in Delilah's ear. Yes, yeah, I'll be there. 
Nate made a growl growling sound and hung up. Love you too, Delilah said into the phone before she sat down. Delilah looked at her queen-sized bed. The thick mattress and her special memory foam pillow beckoned like a languid lover, inviting her back to bed. Delilah so wanted to give in. She loved sleep. She loved just being in her bed. It was like a cocoon, an adult version of the blanket forts she liked to build when she was little. She'd spend all her day in her bed if she could. She wished she could find one of those stay-at-home jobs that let her work in bed in her pyjamas. It wouldn't be ideal for her employer because she'd rather just lounge about and sleep, but it'd be better for her health. She could set her own shifts if she worked for herself. But all her searching for such a job had found nothing but work-at-home scams, the only place that would hire her after she and Richard split up with the diner. All because she had a juvie record and had dropped out of high school for reasons she barely remembered anymore. Life sucked. Delilah looked at her useless alarm clock. No, she couldn't risk it. She had to stay awake. But how? Next door, Mary was on the at least the third repeat of her stupid wake-up song. Delilah knew it would do no good to bang on the wall or go next door to ask Mary to keep it down. Mary wasn't cooking with all her burners. Delilah wasn't sure what was wrong with the woman. She just knew that her previous complaints had disappeared into the void that seemed to make up the mind hidden under Mary's thick grey hair. Delilah didn't want to stay in her apartment and listen to Mary. She might as well do something useful. Shuffling into her tiny pink tiled bathroom, Delilah brushed her teeth and dressed in grey sweats and a red t-shirt. She figured she might as well go for a jog. It had been at least three days since she'd gone exercise. Maybe that had something to do with the fog in her head. Nah, she knew that wasn't true. She tried exercise as a solution, as a solution to her constant exhaustion. It didn't seem to matter how much she worked out. Her body just didn't like bouncing from one schedule to another like a hummingbird fl flitting about. It's just because it's winter, Delilah's best friend Harper said. When spring comes, you'll wake up just like the flowers. Delilah had doubted that, and rightfully so. Spring was here, everything was blooming, except Delilah's energy levels. But whether it would help her head or not, Delilah put on her running shoes and tucked her keys, phone, some money, driver's license and a credit card into her running pouch, which she then hung around her neck. Leaving her little noisy apartment, Mary was still singing, Delilah stepped out into a carpeted hallway that smelled like bacon, coffee and glue. Always with the glue. Delilah snorted as she trotted down three flights of narrow, uneven steps. The super was probably fixing the wall or something. She wasn't exactly living in an upscale place. Two sullen, slouchy teens ambled through the building's lobby as Delilah reached it. They eyed her. She ignored them. Stepping through the scratched grey metal door just in time to watch the sun duck behind a fluffy white cloud. It was one of those bright, breezy spring days that Harper loved and Delilah hated. Maybe if she lived on the coast or in a forest, she could appreciate the happy sun and the sprightly air currents, surrounded by nature and maybe some blossoming flowers. Such a day would feel right. But here? Here in this urban conglomeration of strip walls, strip malls, um, machine shops, car dealerships, vacant locks, and low-income housing, bright and breezy wasn't pleasant. It was jarring. A tiara would look more suitable on a pig. Trying to ignore smells of rotting lettuce, exhaust, and rancid frying oil, Delilah propped her foot on the side of the empty flower planter in front of her grey-walled boxy building. Maybe it would feel more like spring if the planters were growing in, in, uh, were growing flowers instead of rocks. Delilah stretched, then shook her head at her negativity. You know better, she scolded herself. Setting off at a medium paced jog, Delilah pointed herself north, which would take her through the nearest housing area, where she could run past houses and trees instead of struggling businesses and cars. She needed to get out of this dark spiral she was in. She had enough therapy when she was in her teens to know that she had an obsessive personality. Once she latched onto a perspective, there was no unlatching her. Right now, she was stuck on the idea that her life sucked. It was going to continue to suck if she didn't pick up a new idea. As her feet met the uneven sidewalk, Delilah tried to clear the fog from her brain by thinking happy thoughts. 
Every day I'm getting better and better, she chanted. After 10 rounds or so of this affirmation, she was starting to feel snarly, so she traded affirmations for an image of the life she wanted to be living. That made her think of the life she had been living with Richard, which just dropped her further into the negativity pit. When Richard decided he wanted to replace his dark-haired, dark-eyed missus with a blonde, brew, with a blonde blue-eyed wife, Delilah didn't have many options. She'd signed a pre, pre She'd signed an agreement <laughs> before marry, mar marrying Richard. Oh my gosh. She had nothing going into the marriage, and she got nothing in the divorce. Well, not nothing. She received enough of a settlement to get her an apartment, some second-hand furniture, and her 15-year-old tan compact sedan. She got these after she found the one place she was willing to hire her and train her. Given her stunning resume of completed half of 12th grade, babysat, and worked in a fast food restaurant, she was lucky to get what she got. And, awful hours aside, the job had been good to her. Nate had sent her to management training, and she had climbed the ladder from server to shift manager in just a few months. At 23, she was the youngest shift manager in the restaurant. See, Delilah panted, things looking up. She clung on to that tenuously positive thought as she jogged through the ratty old neighbourhood that backed onto an industrial park. The neighbourhood was too run down to be called pretty, but it was filled with beautiful old maple trees and tall sinewy pop poplars um, that swayed in the gentle wind coming up the street. All the trees were filled with light green new growth. The tender leaves encouraged more hopeful thoughts. It, if only for a minute or two. She wondered if the people who lived in the area ever let the trees inspire them. Looking around, she doubted it. A few listless kids were waiting for the, school, for the, for the yellow school buses that belched diesel fumes as they came chugging up behind Delilah. An old guy with a shiny bald head mowed a yard full of weeds, and a woman whose attitude appeared to be worse than Delilah's stood on her front porch glaring on, into a coffee mug. Delilah decided she'd had enough of the neighbourhood, and enough of her run, for that matter. She looped around a defunct car parts store and aimed for home. Home. If only it was home. But her apartment wasn't home. She'd had two homes in her life. One she shared with her parents, until they died when she was 11. The foster homes she had lived in after they were nothing more than places to bide her time. Her other home was with Richard. Now she just had a place where she slept, and she never got to sleep enough. Lately, it felt like his life it felt like life was just one annoying sleep interruption after another, like the world was an alarm that kept going off and waking her from her dreams, the only place she could find a truly happy thought. Back in her apartment, Delilah did her best to ignore her mostly empty pale green walls. She hadn't gotten up the oomph to repaint since she'd moved in. She took off her shoes and put them neatly by the door. She crossed to a well-worn beige leather love seat and <laughs> love seat and straightened the green and yellow afghan draped over its back. What does any of that mean? <laughs> I don't know. Delilah didn't like the afghan. I, I feel like I'm saying that wrong. Like someone from Afghanistan? <laughs> afghan. Okay. Whatever. Uh, but Harper had crocheted it for her. One day, Harper had dropped by and was crushed when she didn't see the afghan let's just say scarf let's say it's a scarf a lovely scarf uh, after that delilah had let it out you just have to be careful to tuck in the wonky bits delilah told uh, harper told delilah when she was presented the gift given that there were many such bits proper tucking was challenging mary continued warbling next door as delilah peeled off her sweaty t-shirt and opened the cabinet where she kept her stash of cookies the cabinet was empty of course. Sighing, Delilah opened her refrigerator. She knew that it, that was a futile action, because she didn't cook and therefore kept nothing in the fridge but bottled water, apple juice, and half-eaten carry-out food from the diner. One of the perks of working at the diner was that she got two free, or me free meals every shift. That kept her pretty well fed. So all she really needed were her cookies, milk, some protein bars, and frozen dinners for the nights she didn't work. The refrigerator revealed that she needed not just cookies, but milk too. Mary's voice wafted through the wall. 
Spring has sprung, and worms have come. Yes, that's what I'm afraid of, Mary, Delilah said. She couldn't stay here. Striding into a small bathroom, Delilah took a lukewarm shower, then dressed in brown leggings and a gold and black plaid jacket. She avoided looking in the mirror when she dried her wavy shoulder-length hair. Delilah didn't wear makeup anymore. Rather than spend money on cosmetics that got her unwanted male attention, she left her face bare and put the extra dollars in her savings account. Even without makeup, Delilah was pretty enough to turn heads. A modelling agency she applied to once told her that she was just a large chin shy of having classically beautiful features. Two agencies had given her na the names of plastic surgeons and told her to come back after she had a little chin and jaw work done. Delilah figured if she wasn't going to put on makeup, why look in the mirror? She knew what she looked like, and lately she wasn't too keen on meeting her own gaze. She saw something there that scared her, something that made her wonder what the future held. Next door, Mary was singing at the top of her lungs about visiting Mars. You go, Mary, Delilah said wishing Mary would go to Mars, and not come back. Grabbing her purse, Delilah headed for her car. She figured she could get to the store, get some cookies and milk, and still come back in time to take a little nap before work. After a visit to the grocery store replenished her oatmeal cookie stash and her milk supply, Delilah left the store from the rear of her parking lot. She liked weaving her way back to her apartment on quiet neighbourhood roads instead of the congested four lanes that ran through the heart of the industrial and re retail splat she lived in. This neighbourhood was a little nicer than the one she ran through. It had bigger houses, greener lawns and newer cars. The trade-off was that the older neighbourhood had those big maple and pop poplar trees and this new neighbourhood had runty cherry trees. She had to admit that the pink blossoms were pretty though. Turning the corner next to the Next to a particularly flowery tree, Delilah spotted a garage sale sign. Its arrow pointed straight ahead, so on a whim, she went that way. Two more signs directed her to take right turns, and eventually, she found herself in front of a two-story Spanish-style home looming over several card tables piled high with household merchandise. Delilah couldn't help herself. She had to stop. Just as Delilah had a thing, about getting stuck in a thought pattern. She had a thing about garage sales. She'd been hooked on them since she was a teen. One of her therapists, Ali, had a theory about it. Ali thought Delilah loved garage sales because they gave her glimpses into her family life. They reminded her of what normal looked like. Delilah wasn't an obsessive garage sale shopper. Yes, she did occasionally buy, she got all her current furniture for garage sales. Mostly though, garage, <laughs> garage? Delilah was a garage sale watcher, an archaeologist of household items, a stuff private eye. She wanted to know what people used, what they collected, what they loved and what they didn't want to keep around anymore. It entertained her. Figuring her milk could sit in the car for 15 minutes or so, Delilah pulled her car behind a dirty red pickup. The pickup and a, a powder blue Cadillac were the only cars parked in front of the house. Just two people wandered among the tables. One person was a heavy-set woman who seemed intent on kitchenware. The other was a slight young man who was browsing piles of books and records. Delilah nodded at them both and also at the middle-aged woman who sat next to a picnic table that held a metal cash box, a pad of paper, and a calculator. Welcome, the woman called out. She had short, brown, spiky hair and her eyes were encircled in heavy black eyeliner. She wore a yellow running suit and she carried a butterscotch coloured chihuahua that was so quiet and docile. Delilah began to wonder whether it was real, but when she stepped up to pet it, the dog wagged its tail. This is Mumford, the woman said. Hello Mumford, Delilah scratched Mumford's behind the ears, becoming Mumford's new best friend. Strolling away from Mumford and his human, Delilah explored the intriguing piles on each table. She poked through small appliances, tools, games, puzzles, electronics and clothes, finding a black leather jacket that intrigued her until she sniffed it and got a nose full of stale mothballs. Wandering to the next table, she found herself in the toy section. 
A glance at a pile of fashion dolls darkened her already precarious mood because the dolls reminded of her of how impossible it was to prevent other foster kids from playing with her stuff when she was growing up. Blocks made her think of the little foster brother she'd gotten close to in foster home number three, only to lose him to adoption a week before she was moved to a different home. She was getting ready to walk away from the table in search of home decor items when her gaze laid, landed on a different doll. With brown curly hair, big dark eyes and a plump pink cheeks, the doll looked almost exactly like the baby Delilah had envisioned having someday with Richard. At the start of their marriage, her baby was as real to her as anything in the physical world. She'd been sure she was going to be a mother, so sure that she had named the she named the baby before the baby was even conceived, her name would be Emma. Intrigued, Delilah circled the table to get closer to the doll. Tucked in a large wooden box full of plush toys and electronic gadgets, that pretty blue that pretty baby face was partially shadowed by the doll's blue hat. The hat's wide brim, fringed in pink ruffles, looked incongruous, wedged between a games console and what looked like a remote controlled aeroplane. Delilah had to shift both, both items to free the doll, which was about two feet tall. Wearing a puffy sleeved 1980s era bright blue full skirted dress with pink ruffled trim and a big bow around the waist, the doll was much heavier than Delilah expected her to be. When she examined the doll, Delilah realized this was because the doll was electronic. Delilah reached for the bright pink tag and was an instructional booklet that hung from the doll's wrist. My name is Ella, the tag read. Ella, so, t so close to Emma. Delilah felt an odd tingle slither through her body. How weird was that? A doll that looked like her long desired baby and a name that was far too close to be a coincidence? Although it had to be a coincidence, didn't it? Delilah opened the little booklet. Her eyes widened. Wow. This is a high-tech doll. According to the booklet, Ella was a helper doll, manufactured by Fazbear Entertainment. Fazbear Entertainment, Delilah whispered. She had never heard of it. The booklet had a list of what Ella was designed for, and the list was impressive. Ella could do all sorts of things. She could keep time and serve as an alarm clock, manage appointments, keep track of lists, take photos, read stories, sing songs, and even serve drinks. Serve drinks? Delilah shook her head. Looking around, Delilah was relieved to see that no one was paying attention to her interest in the doll. Mumford's mum was helping the young man looking at records. The heavyset woman was busy piling china plates next to the metal cash box. No one else had shown up. Delilah kept reading. Ella, the booklet said, could test the pH levels in water, and she could also do personality assessments when you answered a program list of 200 questions. How is it possible for an old toy to be that sophisticated? Both Ella's design and that of her booklet suggested that her clothing matched her year of manufacture. She was not new, not even close. Did she really do all these things? Delilah turned Ella over, and she found a note pinned to Ella's dress. The note explained that the only one of Ella's functions that worked was the alarm clock. Delilah flipped Ella again, and she saw that Ella had a small digital clock embedded in her chest. Concentrating on following the instructions, Delilah attempted to activate the alarm clock feature by pressing a sequence of little buttons found on Ella's round belly. Delilah nearly dropped poor Ella when the last button she pushed made Ella's eyes bolt open. She sucked in her breath at the snapping sound, and her heartbeat quadrupled in a nanosecond when Ella went from asleep to awake in an instant. Delilah held Ella out in front of her. Well, she did need an alarm clock. She checked the little white price tag stuck to the back of Ella's neck. Not too bad. Delilah could handle that, and maybe she could get the price down. Her hundreds of garage sale visits had turned her into a pretty good haggler. Delilah picked up Ella and headed toward Mumford and his mum who were both back behind the cash box. The young man was loading a box of records into his hip pickup. Will you shave $15 off this price? Delilah asked, since she only has one function. The woman held out a hand with bright red, red fingernails. She turned Della over, looked at the price, then looked up at Delilah, who tried to look eager and poor at the same time. Okay, 
Sure, I can do that. Delilah grinned. Great. As she paid, she instructed herself to notice that her day did indeed get better as it went along. It didn't suck to have a nice run, buy more cookies, and find a very cool high-tech doll for a good price at the garage sale. Ella would make a cool conversation piece to perch on Delilah's old oak coffee table. Harper was going to love Ella. And now Delilah had a working alarm clock. She could go home, take a nap, and still have a way to be sure she got up in time for work. Yep, things were looking up. Maybe she could get off the life sucks track after all. Back in her apartment, Delilah set Ella on her nightstand under her white ginger jar lamp. Ella, with her poofy dress all fluffed up and spread out around her, looked good there, content even. Actually, she looked a little pleased with herself, which of course... Uh, which was, of course, a pro of projection because Ella wasn't even aware of herself. It was Delilah who was pleased with herself. She was proud of finding a way to turn the day around. She'd gotten past her funk. That was pretty impressive. Delilah checked her watch and set Ella's clock to match that time. It was barely 11.30am, so Delilah was going to be able to grab a couple hours of sleep. Setting Ella's alarm for 1.35pm... Delilah smoothed her sheets and blanket and lay down on top of them, pulling up the comforter to her chin, not because it was cold in her apartment, but because it made her feel secure. Thankful that Mary was either asleep herself, was running out of, uh, was out of running errands, or had ruined her vocal cords with too much singing, Delilah lay back and let herself ride the currents of drowsiness into blissful unconsciousness. The phone blasted through Delilah's piece, like a rocket shattering mon monastery walls. She shot upright and grabbed for her phone, chastising herself for not shutting it off so her nap wouldn't be interrupted. What? She, she snarled, sorry. Where the hell are you? Nate snarled right back. Huh? It's... Delilah looked at Ella. Ella's clock read 2.25pm. Oh crap. You better be here in 15 minutes or don't ever be here again. Delilah pulled the phone from her ear just in time to avoid the clap she knew was coming. Nate used an old-fashioned corded phone, the kind with the metal hook for the receiver. He expressed himself via the force which, with which he replaced the phone on its hook after a call. He was pissed. Delilah ran into her bathroom, tearing off her clothes as she went. She splashed water on her face. Running a brush through her hair, she trotted back into the bedroom, yanked on her dark blue uniform dress and grabbed her work shoes. Ugly black nose slips. Nate made all the... Oh, sorry. Ugly black nose slips Nate made all the employees wear. As she laced them up, her gaze landed on Ella. Well, you're a disappointment, she told the doll. Ella looked back at her through thick lashes. One of her curls had fallen over an eye. She almost looked mischievous. No wonder the doll was so cheap. The only thing that worked was the clock in the middle of Ella's chest. But without the fire, uh, fire? But without the alarm function, what good was the clock? Ella was still a pretty doll, and she still looked like Delilah's long-desired baby, but now she was a more a reminder of Delilah's frustration than anything else. Finishing with her shoes, Delilah snatched Ella from the nightstand. For a second, she marvelled at the realism of Ella's baby-soft skin, but then she strode into the living room, grabbed her purse, and headed out the door. Dropping down the hall to the stairs, Delilah shook her head when she heard Mary belt out, I love the big, bright world. Outside, the sun had seeded the sky to a ceiling of low-hanging clouds spitting fat raindrops. Delilah paused to hold the door open for two elderly ladies who took an excruciatingly long time to go inside. Then she tore around the side of the building, heading for the dumpsters. Three green hulking dumpsters sat like a trio of trolls at the edge of the apartment building's parking lot. Two were open, one was closed. Delilah aimed toward the second open dumpster, and she swung Ella in an arc, releasing Ella's hand at the apex of the curve. Ella flew through the intermittent precipitation and landed with a reverberating metallic thud in one of the open dumpsters. Delilah winced a little at the sound, feeling guilty for tossing out a doll that looked just like her baby, a doll with surprisingly real feeling hands. Delilah didn't see which dumpster Ella landed in because Nate appeared in the diner's back doorway. Delilah waved at him. 
You late because you were playing with your dolly, he called out. Very funny, Delilah ran toward the diner and reached the door just as the raindrops turned into rain sheets. Nate stepped back to let her by, then closed the door on what was now a downpour. Delilah got a whiff of Nate's aftershave, a subtle scent of whiskey, which he was inordinately proud of. Manny, don't you think? He asked the first time he tried the new product. Delilah had to admit it was. Defying the stereotype of the typical diner owner, Nate was tall, fit, good-looking, and well-groomed. About 50, he had short, graying black hair and a tidy, uh, close-trimmed beard. He also had pewter grey eyes that could impale you with his dish pleasure. He was aiming those eyes at Delilah now. You're lucky you're good and the customers love you, he said, but you need to get a handle on your tardiness. I can't let you slide forever. I know, I know, I'm trying. That you are. Delilah's shift went quickly. That was the upside of working the 2 to 10. The rush could kick your butt, but at least time flew by. Delilah got back to her apartment about 10.30pm, thankfully missing one of Mary's goodnight songs. The building was pretty quiet. All Delilah could hear was rap music coming from one of the apartments at the end of the hall and the sound of laughter coming from the TV on the floor above. Closing her door on what smelled like burnt Brussels sprouts, Delilah hoped the noxious odour wouldn't follow her, and it didn't. Her apartment smelled like pine cleaner and oranges. It smelled better than Delilah, who smelled like grease as she always did at the end of a shift. Peeling off her clothes, she deposited them inside the... I, I can never say this word. Uh, cheddar. <laughs> See, um... Uh, no, I... Uh, there's like... Uh, there's a way to say it, but I, I cannot think of it right now. I'm sorry. Uh, inside the chest that sat by her door. The chest, combined with a charcoal air purifying bag tucked inside of it, solved the grease smell problem she'd had for weeks when she first got the diner job. In the shower, Delilah washed off the rest of the grease smell. Then she pulled on a long, uh, a red long-sleeved nightshirt and settled in bed with half a container of beef stro- stroganoff and green beans. The cook who worked the 2 to 10 shift was the best one Nate had. The stroganoff was great. While she ate, Delilah watched the rerun of a comedy show on the old TV sitting on top of her antique maple dresser. The show didn't make her laugh. It didn't even make her smile. It just helped her feel less lonely when she ate. About 10.30pm, Delilah set her empty styrofoam container atop a pile of home decor magazines on her nightstand. She turned off her ginger lamp and curled up on her side. The streetlights that hovered over the parking lot outside cast sinister distorted shadows throughout her room. They looked like giant bony fingers reaching toward the bed. Delilah closed her eyes and willed sleep to come quickly, which it did. It ended just as quickly. Delilah's eyes shot open. Her non-alarm clock's uh, lit face told her it was 1.35am. She sat up and looked around. What had awakened her? Looking toward her window, she rubbed her eyes. It had been a sound, some kind of intrusive sound coming from outside her window. Had it been a ringing sound? A buzzing sound? Delilah tilted her head, listening. She could hear nothing but the whoosh of cars on the road. She looked back at the clock. It was now 1.36am. Wait, she'd awoken at 1.35am. She'd set the doll's alarm for 1.35. What if she'd missed the AM-PM settings? Oops, she whispered. Sorry, Ella. Delilah thought about going outside to retrieve the possibly still working doll, but she was too tired. She'd look in the morning. Delilah snuggled under the covers and went back to sleep. You threw it away? Harper drew in her chin, raised an eyebrow, and quirked her mouth in her what were you thinking expression. I thought it was broken. Yeah, but it could be a collectible. It could be worth something. Harper's huge blue eyes lit up at the idea of dollar signs. Delilah could almost see a calculator totaling imaginary amounts in Harper's mind. Delilah and Harper sat at an elevated round table in Harper's favourite espresso place. Delilah sipped cinnamon tea. Harper was drinking some kind of fancy quadruple espresso. Harper was addicted to coffee. The espresso place was a brick-walled narrow space with lots of stainless steel and chrome and very little wood. And just before 11am, it wasn't very crowded. A dark-skinned woman with pigtails sat at one table, concentrating on whatever was on her laptop, and an elderly man munched on a muffin while reading the paper. Behind the counter, machines fizzed and spit. Haven't I told you anything? 
Harper asked. Always try to sell it before you toss it, remember? I was late for work. I was a little stressed. You need to learn to meditate. Then I'd miss work because I got lost in meditation. Harper laughed, and everyone else in the place turned to look at her. Harper's laugh was just... was like a resounding sea lion bark. You could tell how funny she thought something was by the number of barks. Delilah's comment warranted just one. I'm really sorry, I haven't had my, uh... <laughs> my video recording on so you haven't been able to see any of the any of the words but um we continue <laughs> this keeps happening to me I, I keep forgetting to switch to um screen record mode anyway um how do you like the new play delilah asked it's yippy skippy fun my lines are all crap but i love love my character delilah smiled harper had been delilah's best friend for almost six years ever since the two girls landed in foster care together Determined that the foster home would be their last, they teamed up to help each other survive the regi regimented structure imposed by Gerald, the ex-military husband of the couple who'd taken them in. Whenever Gerald admonished uh, them for not adhering to his schedule, reminding them that this had to happen at 500, or is that of time, 5 o'clock, and that to happen at 6, 10... Harper would mumble something like, and you can jump off a cliff and I'll, use, I'll screw you a hundred. She made Delilah laugh, which helped her survive. Complete opposites in both looks and personality, Harper and Delilah would probably have never been friends if they hadn't been thrown in some scheduling hell together. However, they made their friendship work. When Harper announced her mischievous plan for getting a famous playwright to cast her in his plays, Delilah just said, be safe. When Delilah said she was going to marry her knight in shining armor and have babies, Harper just said, don't sign a pre uh, prenup. I don't know what that word means. Uh, Harper's followed Delilah's advice and had the grace to not to say, I told you so, when Delilah failed to follow hers. I think you should look for her, Harper said. What? Ella, I think you should look for her. Harper toyed with one of the dozen or so blonde braids she had coiled around her head. Wearing heavy, colourful makeup and a skin-tight green dress, she had an exotic Medusa look going on. Because she might be worth something, Delilah nodded. It's not just that. You said she looked like the baby you thought you were going to have. That's a pretty bizarre thing, don't you think? That you'd find a doll that looks like this imaginary baby. What if she's some kind of sign? You know I don't believe in signs. Maybe you should. Delilah shrugged, and they spent the rest of their visit talking about Harper's play and Harper's latest boyfriend. Then they reminded each other, as they always did, of the hell they'd escaped. No, you cannot use the bathroom. Not until 9.45. That's your scheduled time to urinate, Harper intoned. She did great imp impersonations, and she had Gerald nailed. She could also eerily mimic the alarm Gerald used to signal every scheduled event in the household. The alarm was a sort of cross between a ring, a buzz, and a siren. Delilah always covered her ears when Harper felt compelled to impersonate it. Richard once asked Delilah why she and Harper needed to relive their past regularly. Uh, she said, It reminds us of how good things are now, even when they seem not so good. Anything is better than living with Gerald. As it always did when Delilah and Harper were together, time disappeared. When Delilah went out to her car, she realised she barely had time to get home and get changed before her shift. Why are you being so nice to me? Delilah asked Nate when she arrived for her 2 to 10. She stood in front of the schedule posted on the bulletin board in the employee break room. Nate had scheduled Delilah for the 2 to 10 shift for a full week in a row. She couldn't remember the last time she had worked the same shift for a week. And this shift was especially good right now because as long as she went to bed within a couple of hours after ending her shift, she'd wake up in plenty of time for work. She wouldn't even need an alarm clock. She could put up with the evening rush in exchange for decent sleep. Nate looked up from doing his daily paperwork at the round table by the bulletin board. It's in my best interests. I like it when you show up on time for work. Well, it's easier to show up on time when my body can figure out what time it is, Delilah said. Wuss, slave driver, whiner, meanie. Delilah started her shift as close to happy as she'd been in some time. Work was going well. When Nate teased, Nate was happy. When Nate was happy, things ran smoothly. Delilah had such a good time at work that she came back to the apartment in a good mood. 
She ate meatloaf and broccoli in a good mood, and she went to sleep in a good mood. The good mood disappeared, though, when she sat up in her bed, her muscles rigid, listening. Who was whispering? Someone was whispering. Delilah could hear indecipherable, sibilant words coming from... from where? Wide awake, she looked at her clock. It was 1.35am. Again? Delilah strained to understand the whispers, but they stopped. Now all she could hear were the cars on the road. Where did that whispering come from? Ella. It had to be. Harper was right. Delilah should have looked for Ella. She should have checked, not because Ella might have been valuable or because she was a sign, but because apparently her alarm was still going off at 1.35am. But Delilah still hadn't, uh, but sorry, but Delilah hadn't had time before she went to work. She'd check today for sure. She couldn't believe Ella's alarm was so powerful she could hear it from here, but then again, wasn't Mary's singing enough painful proof of the apartment's thin walls? Delilah lay back down and closed her eyes. Ella's face filled her inner vision. Delilah opened her eyes. She sat up again. I'm not going to go and get any sleep until I find her, she thought. Delilah got up and pulled on sweats. Stuffing her feet in a pair of slip-on clogs, she reached in her nightstand drawer for a flashlight. The dumpsters were well lit, but if Ella was partially buried, Delilah might have trouble spotting her. Throwing on an ugly, multicoloured cardigan Harper had crocheted for her, Delilah left her apartment, went down the silent hallway and stairs and exited the building. Outside, the air was chilly, but the sky was clear. A few stars even managed to shine through the frothy glow of the urban night. Delilah paused just outside the building and looked around to be sure she was alone. She was. Padding around the building, she headed for the dumpsters. The yawning green trash bins sat ugly and under the spotlights of the street lamps and the diner's floodlights. One of the two that had been open before was closed, and the one that had been closed was open. They all looked a little askew, like they'd been moved around. Great. If they'd been moved, finding Ella would be like playing a game of hat trick. This might take longer than Delilah had envisioned. Glancing around again, Delilah shrugged. She might as well get out. She might as well get it over with. Approaching the middle dumpster, the one she thought she'd thrown Ella into, Delilah lifted the lid, stood on her tiptoes, and shone the light down inside. The light landed on a mound of plastic garbage bags, a ratty old blanket, a smattering of takeout containers, and a sprinkling of empty cans. Her light didn't reveal the obnoxious smell of dirty diapers that Delilah's nose discovered as soon as she opened the lid. Delilah gently closed the lid, careful not to let it clang shut. If Ella was in this dumpster, she was buried. Delilah decided she'd rather check out the other two dumpsters first before diving into any of them. So she did her tiptoe light aiming routine first at the open one that she thought had also been open when she chucked Ella into a dumpster. The only thing that set this dumpster apart from the first one Delilah looked at was a couple dozen old paperbacks cascading over the piles of stuffed garbage bags. Delilah was tempted to take one of them, a murder mystery, but it had a, sp a, a suspicious red stain on it. She didn't want to know what the stain was. The last dumpster Delilah checked was the one she was pretty sure had been closed when she tossed away Ella, so she wasn't surprised to find more of the same kind of trash and no sign of Ella. Um, stimmied, I don't know what that word means, <laughs> stymied, uh, Delilah turned off her flashlight and thought for a moment. Did she really have to get in these dumpsters and dig for Ella? She didn't know for sure that it was Ella waking her up. For all she knew, it was Mary singing some dumb middle-of-the-night song or a cat in heat. Yeah, but why did she get awakened precisely at 1.35am both last night and tonight? Coincidence? It was possible, wasn't it? Harper once went through this period when she kept waking up at 3.33am, and then she saw 333 everywhere for a couple of months. Harper researched the number and found out it was some kind of spiritual sign. What if 135 was a spiritual sign just for Delilah? She snorted and turned her back on the dumpsters. Now she was just being silly. She headed back to the front of the building. She'd stick with a con coincidence theory for now. It was easier and less smelly than assuming Ella was the problem. The coincidence explanation got strained when Delilah awoke at 1.35am for the third night in a row. 
This time, she was sure there had been a sound against her window. Had it been a scratching sound? A tapping? Whatever it was, it had been ominous enough that Delilah immediately grabbed her flashlight and aimed it at her blinds. Then after staring at, an, at her unmoving blinds for a minute, she got up the courage to tiptoe across the room and look behind them. Nothing was at the window, and down below in the parking lot, the dumpsters hadn't moved from the positions they'd been in the night before. Delilah blew out air. She was going to have to search every one of these dumpsters. Should she wait for daylight? That would make it easier, wouldn't it? And if someone asked what she was doing, she'd answer truthfully that she threw out ev that she threw out something she shouldn't have thrown out. Delilah left the window and took a step toward her bed. She stopped. What day was it? Working all sorts of weird shifts. Delilah rarely knew what day of the week it was. She thought for a second. Wednesday. Well, crap, she grumbled. The dumpsters were emptied on Thursday mornings early. If she waited, Ella would be gone. But wait, that was a good thing, right? If Ella was gone, her alarm couldn't go off and wake up Delilah. Delilah didn't think Ella was worth anything, and she was sure Ella's resemblance to Emma was a fluke. There was no reason why Delilah should have to climb through stinky trash. She could just let the garbage truck take her problem away. Delilah smiled and got back in bed. Thursday night, or rather Friday early morning, Delilah's eyes opened to see 1.35am. Again. She was immediately fully alert. Her heart beat loudly, fast and steady like a driving beat on a timpani. This manic pace wasn't... Wait. Wasn't up Delilah. Okay. I, I think there's a, been a little bit skipped, but whatever. Um, Delilah didn't think Ella was worth anything and she was sure Ella's resemblance to Emma was a fluke. Oh, never mind. Sorry. It's the page is weird thing, um, but yeah, it was also a reaction to Delilah's disturbingly strong feeling that something was under her bed, something was moving under her bed, but that couldn't be, could it? Delilah listened. She didn't hear anything at first, but then she wondered if she was hearing a scuttling sound on the carpet under her bed. She sat up and started to swing a leg over the side of the bed. She stopped. What if something was under there? It could grab her foot. Quickly pulling her foot back under the covers, Delilah reached out and turned on her nightstand lamp. As soon as her room was lit, she leaned over and checked the floor all around her bed. She saw nothing but the tan and cream coloured carpet she'd gotten at a yard sale. She'd just imagined the sound. Or something was still under her bed. Delilah reached for the nightstand drawer. She grabbed her flashlight, turned it on, took a deep breath, then hung over the bed and shined the light beneath it. Nothing was there. Okay. This was getting crazy. It was four nights in a row. It had to be Ella. But the dumpsters had been emptied. Delilah crossed her legs and rubbed her arms. They were covered with goosebumps. What if the trash collectors didn't, didn't completely empty the dumpsters? Or what if Ella fell out as the bin was being emptied? Delilah had to check, and she had to check now. She needed to know. So, repeating her steps from two nights before, Delilah went out to the dumpsters with her flashlight. Tonight, they were all closed. They usually were after trash pickup on Thursdays. Delilah approached the dumpsters in order from right to left. She lifted three lids and shined her light into three nearly empty bins. All she found were two bags of household trash, a bag of, di uh, of dirty diapers and its corresponding nasty odour, a broken lamp and a sad pile of old men's clothing. The only thing that could have hidden Ella was the pile of clothing, so Delilah, holding her breath, hung over the edge of the dumpster that had the clothing and used her flashlight to poke around in the pile. The only thing under the, uh, under the clothes were more clothes. Delilah picked her way between the dumpsters and around the area surrounding them. She shined her flashlight into every dark nook or cranny she'd spotted. No Ella. The doll was gone, for sure. She wasn't here. She couldn't be what was waking Delilah up at 1.35am. So what was? Delilah woke up at 10.10 the next morning, and the first thing she did when she got up, besides covering her ears so she wouldn't hear Mary singing about dusting books, was call Harper and ask her to come by. She woke her, uh, Harper up, but Harper never let stuff like that bother her. Sure, I'll be there in a bit, she chirped. When Harper arrived, she dropped her voluminous sack-style leather purse on the floor, flopped onto the love seat, and said, What's the problem? 
How do you know there's a problem? Delilah sat down next to her. You don't normally ask me to come over. Oh yeah. Delilah had basically summoned her friend. That showed how rattled she was. I have a question, Delilah said. Must be a good one. Did you rescue Ella from the dumpster yesterday? What? Mary sang out. Because I feel fizzy, yay! <laughs> Harper grinned. She liked Mary's songs. The doll. Ella. Did you get her out of the dumpster? Harper ruffled her eyebrows. Why would I do that? You said she could be worth something. Well, she could, but she's your doll, not mine. If I was going to look for her, I'd tell you. Delilah rubbed her face with her hands. Yeah, she should have known that. Why are you asking? Did you look and not find her? Yeah, I looked, sort of. I didn't dig through the trash, but then the dumpsters were emptied. Okay, so Ella is gone. What's the big? Delilah hadn't told Harper about being wakened at 1.35am every morning. She just told her about finding the doll and throwing it out when it didn't work. She couldn't think of a way to tell Harper about waking up at the same time four nights in a row without sounding like she was overreacting. Besides, Harper would just talk about signs again if Delilah told her. But since I'm here, you want to go get some lunch? Harper asked. Delilah waved goodbye to Harper with relief. She was glad the lunch was over because in the middle of it she'd come up with an idea. Now she could finally act on it. Pointing her car in the direction of the newer neighbourhood with the runty cherry trees, she went in search of the house where she'd found the garage sale, and Ella. She planned to get some answers about the doll from the doll's previous owner. Without signs to direct her, Delilah missed a turn and had to backtrack. Eventually, though, she pulled up in front of the Spanish-style house where she'd met Mumford, the friendly chihuahua. But Mumford wasn't home. Nobody was even though Delilah could see from the street that the bare windows revealed vacant rooms in the house, she pulled into the empty driveway and got out of her car. Inhaling the still humid air, she wrinkled her nose at the smell that reminded her of rotting leaves. Um, the neighbourhood was unusually silent. The only thing she heard was a lone dog barking in the distance. This was the house, wasn't it? She studied it, then turned and looked at the surrounding houses. Yes, this was it. Weird, she said out loud. But was it? After all, the women who'd lived here had been having a garage sale. People did that before they moved, right? Delilah couldn't read anything into the fact that there was no trace of anyone or anything at this place where she found Ella. So why did it feel pretentious? Hoping she might stumble over some clue to where Mumford and the woman with the spiky hair might have gone, Delilah circled the house and peeked in windows. She found nothing. The house was completely empty for a single wadded up paper towel on the counter in the kitchen. All Delilah got from her exploration was a creepy coil of unease that wrapped itself around her chest and didn't leave, even after she practically ran to her car and drove away as fast as she could. Back in her apartment, Delilah ate enough cookies and milk to dissipate the disquiet she'd taken away from the house. Okay, she said, plan B. Setting up her laptop in her bed, Delilah got comfy. She checked her watch. She had about 45 minutes until she had to go to work. Plenty of time, she hoped. Next door, Mary was singing about mushrooms, but Delilah didn't care. She was on a mission. She figured she could find information about Ella on the internet. She started her web search with Ella doll. She was afraid that, would be too, that it would be too general, but one of the millions of results gave her some information. Production of the Ella doll, Delilah discovered, was discontinued for undisclosed reasons. Jumping off from that fact, she tried to find out more about the doll, but she kept bumping into the same useless information or the text of the instruction booklet she'd already read. Running out of time, she began trying crazy searches. Haunted Ella doll, broken Ella doll, unique Ella doll, defective Ella doll, special Ella doll. These searches took her into a lot of pointless blogs that had nothing to do with the Ella doll. But one of the searches for special Ella doll led her to an online ad posted by a user named Phineas, who was trying to find one of the dolls. His ad referenced the special Ella doll, and said he was willing to pay a premium for the doll's energy, whatever that meant. Delilah checked her watch. She had to get to work. So much for her clever ideas. All they'd done was put her more on edge than she already was. Three more nights. 
three more 1.35 a.m. awakenings. One night, Delilah had awakened certain that she was being watched. Every hair on her body had bristled like little antennae. Uh, an antennae? Antennae. Um, is that how you say it? Antennae? That doesn't sound right to me. Little antennae telling her she was under scrutiny. In her mind's eye, she saw Ella's huge, dark eyes boring into her soul. When she lunged for her light, she thought something touched her arm, but the light revealed she was alone. The next night, Delilah heard a rustling sound so faint it shouldn't even have been noticeable, but it still jointed, uh, it still jolted Delilah from sleep. When she opened her eyes, the sound got louder. It was coming from her closet as if someone was riffling through her clothes. Fumbling for her light, Delilah got up, strode to her closet door and flung it open. The closet contained nothing but her clothes and shoes. The next night, a rapping sound ro uh, woke up Delilah. In her dream, the rapping came from a woodpecker. Yo, I'm a woodpecker and I like to rap. <laughs> That's what I'm imagining in my head right now. Um, then she was, aw oh, sorry, when she was awake though, she realized the rapping was coming from the floor. Something was under the floorboards, tapping at the wood, as if trying to find a way out. Fighting hysteria, Delilah managed to get her light on. As soon as the room was lit up, the tapping stopped. Delilah was starting to get a little freaked out. She was so freaked out that she was now having trouble sleeping. After her shift, Delilah was so exhausted, she'd fall into bed and go right to sleep. But then something would wake her at 1.35 a.m. Some sound or sensation, something just beyond the peri uh, periphery of Delilah's consciousness, would intrude into her sleep and drag her into wakefulness. Tonight, it was the sound of something in the wall between her apartment and Mary's. It was a scratching sound, wasn't it? Or was it a, a, a droning? Could it have been an alarm? No, Delilah didn't think so. She was pretty sure something was moving around in the wall. Delilah turned the light on and looked at her empty bedroom. She pulled her knees to her chest and tried to rein in her galloping heart. Here was the problem with all these nocturnal in intrusions. They all sounded like something trying to get to her, something sneaking up on her or beckoning to her in some way. Delilah was sure it was Ella. The doll was still nearby, she had to be. And she was functional, she just wasn't functional in a helpful way. Delilah had given this a lot of thought, a ton of thought. It was basically all she'd thought about for days. She'd decided that Ella was not at all pleased about being tossed out. Maybe being discarded activated some subroutine that turned on new functions in Ella, hidden functions. Maybe the person who made Ella had a sick sense of humour and thought it would be a fun trick to play on someone who had the audacity to throw his creation away, or maybe Ella malfunctioned. Whatever, the bottom line was that Ella was out to get Delilah. Delilah could think of no other explanation for what was happening. But what, she could, uh, but what could she do about it? She stared at the thin barrier between her domain and Mary's. Mary. What if Mary had the doll? Mary's apartment looked out over the dumpsters, and she was home all day. What if she saw Delilah throw the doll away and she went out and got it? Delilah had to find out. Starting to get out of bed to go knock on Mary's door, Delilah stopped. It was the middle of the night. Pounding on someone's door in the middle of the night was a good way to start a confrontation. She didn't want a confrontation. She didn't want Mary to get defensive and hide Ella. No, she'd have to wait until morning and try to get Mary to give up Ella by playing nice. Mary was singing about penguins when Delilah got out of the shower at 7.30am. Dressing in her exercise clothes because she figured she'd need a run after speaking to Mary, Delilah went into the kitchen and warmed up the slice of peach pie she'd brought back from the diner the night before. She didn't know much about Mary, but she did know Mary liked pie, especially peach pie. Delilah left her apartment when Mary shifted into a verse about polar bears. As she knocked on Mary's flimsy front door, Mary belted out a line about an iceberg and then went silent. A second later, the door opened. Miss Delilah, what a nice surprise! <laughs> Mary grinned and reached out to grab Delilah. Delilah barely had time to move the pie to the side before Mary's big arms pulled her into a tight hug. Delilah's nose got buried in Mary's substantial shoulder. 
Mary smelled like sausages and sweat and lavender. Hi, Mary, Delilah said when Mary released her. She followed Mary into the peaceful Japan-inspired oasis that was Mary's apartment. The first time Delilah had knocked on Mary's door to talk to her about the, si uh, the singing, Delilah had been expecting to find a cluttered apartment filled with knickknacks and books. Mary just looked like that kind of woman, about 5'8", of well-padded, middle-aged frump. Mary had permed grey hair, a lined face, and round tortoise uh, shell glasses perched on a slightly upturned nose. She wore clothes in layers, vests uh, over shirts, over skirts, over dresses, usually in a mismatched colour hodgepodge. But Mary's apartment looked nothing like Mary. Please take off your shoes, Mary sang when Delilah forgot. Oh, right, sorry. Delilah held the pie in one hand while she balanced on one foot and then the other to pull off her running shoes. She placed the shoes on the little rack just inside the door. Then she bowed to Mary when Mary bowed to her. I bought you... Oh, never mind, this is Delilah. I bought you peach pie. Delilah held out the warm pie container. Oh, that's just the thing. The Mary grabbed the container, bowed to Delilah again, and glided into her pristine kitchen to get chopsticks. Delilah didn't know if Mary's decor and lifestyle came from a history with Japanese culture or whether Mary just fancied herself Japanese. She'd never asked because it felt rude to say, what's with the Japanese stuff? But Delilah had read enough to know she was standing on a tatami mat and that a bamboo screen hid the bedroom door and that she was being ushered to blue and grey zabutons set up around a chabodai on the far side of the living room. I don't know what the hell is happening. Uh, a gnarled bonsai in a blue container sat on the chabodai. Okay, other than the mat, the table and the Japanese pillows, the living room was bare. I think I understood like half of that. Uh, as Delilah sat on one of the grey cushions, she began questioning her idea that Mary had taken the doll. What would this strange woman want with a doll? It definitely didn't seem to suit her interior decor. But then, Delilah had never seen Mary's bedroom. What if that door hid a collection of dolls in frilly dresses? Mary placed a tea set on the chub... chub stop saying that word! Chabudai. Uh, along with a plate of almond cookies, the pie container, and chopsticks. Having gone through the ritual before, Delilah let Mary pour the tea and offer her a cookie before she said anything. As Mary deftly uh, scooped up a peach slice with her chopsticks, Delilah said, I went to a cool garage sale the other day. <clears throat> uh, Ma Mary placed the peach slice in her mouth, closed her eyes. Uh, and chewed with what looked like sheer joy. When she finished chewing, she leaned toward Delilah and waved a chopstick in front of Delilah's face. Secondhand stuff brings secondhand energy. Old hands, bad hands, tainted with story. Mary sang. She waved her chopstick back and forth like a metronome, keeping time with her song's beat. You don't like secondhand things? Mary set down the chopsticks, grabbed the collar off her yellow, bra uh, yellow blouse with both hands, and pulled the collar from her skin to shake it several times. She sang, Penguins, penguins, pull in the cold, polar bears scare away the old. Delilah frowned. She thought she'd figured out the secondhand song, but this new verse baffled her. Mary let go of her collar and picked up her chopsticks again. Hot flashes. She broke off a piece of crust and tweezed it between her chopsticks. Delilah sipped tea and asked herself what she was doing here. How was she going to get an answer out of Mary? She'd be better off knocking out the woman and searching her apartment. Delilah watched Mary eat, even if she was capable of knocking someone out, which she wasn't. Delilah didn't think it would be a good idea to take on Mary. Mary was not only taller and bigger, she probably knew some kind of martial arts or something. The past leaves stains, Mary said. What? No garage sales, no antique shops, no thrift stores. I don't want to open all doors, Mary intoned. I'm just going to do her voice like really annoying at the, at the top of my like <laughs> the highest pitch I can do. Um, Delilah nodded. She was pretty sure she got that. 
If Mary didn't like old stuff because she thought old stuff had stains of the past, she wasn't likely to have pulled an old doll from a dumpster. Not unless she had done it and now she was just messing with Delilah. Delilah stared into Mary's eyes. Mary stopped eating pie and stared right back. Her eyes were pale green, streaked with swirls of yellow, kind of freaky. Delilah blinked and looked away. She stood. I need to go for a run, Delilah said. I need to finish my pie, Mary said. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, but I have to go. No sorry, no sorry, no sorry, just be, just be, just be, Mary said. Um, okay, uh, bye, Mary. <laughs> Of course, Mary's farewell was more singing. <clears throat> bye bye, so long, ta ta, toodaloo, until later, alligator. Delilah waved at Mary and fled the woman's apartment. On the tenth night of chilling 1.35am awakenings, Delilah locked her lamp onto the floor in a pure panic to turn it on. Instead, she'd broken it, and she was whimpering in fear by the time she got her flashlight from her nightstand drawer and flipped its switch. She was so sure the flashlight was going to reveal Ella at the side of her bed that she screamed as the light brightened the room, but nothing was there. Delilah, icy tendrils skittering all over her body, shot the flashlight beam all over the room. The light quivered as it scanned the darkness because Delilah's hand was shaking. With every new shift in the flashlight's direction, she absolutely expected the light to reveal Ella's face emerging out of the dim. Where had the doll gone? Ella had been here. Delilah was sure of it. What else could have made those soft little footfalls that snatched at Delilah from her sleep? Delilah had been dreaming. She was lying in a hammock alone. Then she'd heard footsteps, small and light, pattering closer and closer. She'd awakened when they reached her. Delilah kept shifting her flashlight's beam, and she listened. There, the soft steps. She aimed her light at the bedroom door. It was open. Had she left it open? She couldn't remember. She thought she'd closed it, but she couldn't be sure. She leaned toward the door and cocked her head, willing her ears to tell her what she was hearing. Were those footsteps in the living room? She heard a click. Was that her front door? Wanting to go look, while also not wanting to go look, Delilah chose to give in to inertia. She stayed right where she was, clutching her flashlight with one hand and grasping her sheets close to her body with the other. Still listening with every ounce of her being, she thought she'd heard a sound out in the hallway. Was that Mary's door opening and closing? Delilah hesitated for another few seconds, then she jumped out of bed, ran to the wall and turned on the light. She looked around her bedroom. Everything was normal. She turned, opened the bedroom door the rest of the way, and ran into the living room to turn on that light. Again, everything looked as it should have. Her apartment door was closed and bolted. She was alone. That was the problem, wasn't it? Delilah crossed her uh, to her love seat and pulled Harper's afghan around her shoulders. Uh, she sat sideways with her legs tucked under her. By the time Delilah had met Harper, she'd resigned herself to being alone. Sure, she was surrounded by foster kids, but they weren't family and they weren't friends either, until Harper. None of them loved her, and she didn't love them. None of her foster parents had loved her either. No one loved Delilah until Harper came along, and even then, Harper couldn't love her enough. After her parents died, Delilah didn't think she'd ever be loved the way her parents had loved her until she met Richard at a Halloween party. She was a senior in high school. He was a sophomore in college. Their gazes locked over eyeball and blood punch and they spent the rest of the night dancing. When Richard decided to take a sabbatical from college, he begged Delilah, the love of his life, to come along. She was just two weeks from turning 18, so they waited, and on her birthday, she said goodbye to Harper and the structure Happy Gerald. She headed off to Europe with Richard. It was January, so he took her to the Alps and taught her to ski. For a year and a half, they played all over Europe. Finally, Richard's dad dem uh, demanded that Richard come home and start working in the family business if he wasn't going to finish college. Richard proposed to Delilah. His parents and sister, with obvious reluctance, welcomed Delilah into the family. They had a fairy tale wedding. Delilah had felt like a princess. Then they moved into his parents' uh, guest house. 
From that point, all they had to do was stick to their plan. Richard would move up in the company, they'd have babies, they'd eventually get their own place. They were going to live happily ever after. Instead, Delilah was here, alone. Or not alone. She wasn't sure which was worse. Every day at 4.30pm, Mary left her apartment to go for her daily constitutional. Even if Mary hadn't explained this to Delilah, she would have known because Mary sang about it. Delilah had to get through two more work days and two more terrifying 1.35am wake-ups before she had a day off, so she was home at 4.30pm. Both of those nights, Delilah had listened to pitter-pat and rat-a-tat sounds that convinced her Ella was retreating to Mary's apartment after she tormented Delilah. Delilah was convinced that Mary had Ella no matter what Mary said about old stains. So she decided she was going to break into Mary's apartment and look for the doll. This plan was only possible because working in a diner had some perks. You got to meet a large variety of people with a large variety of skills. One of Delilah's regulars was a private detective, Hank, and the night before, Delilah had asked him how hard it was to pick a lock. Depends on the lock, Hank had said, adjusting the vest of one of his three-piece suits he always wore. Single apartment door lock, she'd said. Deadbolt? Delilah had shaken her head. Mary didn't use her deadbolt. She sang a lot about thrust... Th thrust... <laughs> That's a Freudian slip-up. Uh, she sang a lot about trust and faith. Delilah had thought the detective would ask her why she wanted to know, but instead he just asked if any of the women in the place had a hairpin, and he'd taken one from Mrs. Jeffrey, an elderly woman who came in daily for rice pudding. He'd led Delilah to the door of the restaurant's storage room, and in five minutes he'd taught her how to pick a lock. Good thing Nate wasn't around. He wouldn't have liked knowing how easy it was to get into the supplies. So, thanks to Hank, it took Delilah only a minute to break into Mary's apartment. Once inside, she had to take another minute to get her breathing under control. Her heart felt like it was hopping around spastically like hot oil on a flat cooktop. Her legs felt weird as if they were going to run away while standing still. Adrenaline, she thought. Clearly she wasn't cut out to be a spy. She was a mess and all she had done was get inside the door. Well, why don't you get on with it so you can be done? She asked herself. She didn't think this was going to take long. Ella wasn't in the living room unless she was invisible. That left the kitchen cabinets, the bedroom and the bathroom. Delilah forced herself to move. As she suspected, Mary's kitchen cabinets were sparsely filled and neatly organised. Ella was not hiding among the stoneware or inside Mary's wok, nor was she in the refrigerator or the freezer. The bathroom was similarly near empty. It just had to be sh uh, just to be sure, Delilah checked the toilet tank. Not only was it empty of hidden items, it was unusually clean. Delilah moved on to the bedroom. There, she met her first challenge. Mary's bedroom was filled with storage bins, stacks and stacks of black plastic storage bins that lined every wall and a pairing of two each made up Mary's nightstands. Other than the storage bins, all that Mary's bedroom held was a futon and a pillow, both lying on the floor. Delilah checked her watch. She had about 40 minutes before Mary would be back. She wanted to be gone in 30 or less to be safe, so she started opening bins. Delilah discovered a lot about Mary in the next 35 minutes. She learnt that Mary was at some point a teacher, that she was a widow, that she made or had once made beaded jewellery, that she loved musicals, that she had come from a family with three kids, and that she had once had a child of her own who had died in a fire. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, no. <coughs> Delilah figured, that gave, uh, Delilah figured that gave Mary the right to be a little weird. Mary had a laptop, which she apparently used to watch her movies, and she had an old manual typewriter. Mary typed up her songs. They filled seven of the 33 bins in the room. Delilah, moving so fast she was dripping with sweat after the first 11 bins, looked in every bin. Ella was not in any of them. Giving up and about to head for the door, Delilah backtracked and carefully poked the futon on the pillow. They were the only places where uh, left where Ella could be hiding. No Ella. 
Delilah looked around to be sure she'd restacked all the bins neatly. She hoped she'd put them in the right order. Even if she hadn't, she had to leave. Now, she'd gone well past her margin for safety. She barely made it back to her apartment in time. Right after she closed and bolted her door, she heard Mary's singing voice trilling. <clears throat> Blood flowing, heart pumping, healthy, happy zing. <laughs> Delilah leaned against her door, then slid to the floor. She was depleted and baffled. If Mary didn't have Ella, who did? And why wouldn't Ella leave her alone? On the 13th night of Delilah's sleep invasion of hell, Delilah heard an actual alarm at 1.35am. It was so loud that she dreamt she was being attacked by a huge bee. She was running from the bee when she opened her eyes and reached for the lamp she'd brought at a garage sale. The lamp was metal with LED bulbs. It wouldn't break. Delilah might though. The night before, Delilah had wondered, without much expectation at all, if she'd managed to live through the 12 nights of Ella. Maybe it would just stop, because Ella didn't know for sure why it had started, it could just stop. Right? Wrong. It wasn't stopping. In fact, now Delilah could still hear a buzzing in her ears, like a high-pitched whirring sound. Was she actually hearing that? Or was something wrong with her ears? What did uh, tinnitus sound like? She'd heard about tinnitus from one of the old men who congregated in the diner daily to grouse about the state of their bodies and the state of the world in general. He'd said his ears rang all the time. Delilah wasn't hearing a ringing. It was, it was nothing. It had stopped. Delilah turned over and put her face in her pillow. Why wouldn't Ella leave her alone? And where was she? If Delilah could destroy Ella, it would stop, but she couldn't destroy what she couldn't find. The day after she searched Mary's place, Delilah had started wondering whether one of her neighbours had gotten the doll out of the dumpster. She'd spent three hours knocking on every door in the building to ask if anyone had found Ella. Amazingly, only eight doors had gone unanswered. Everyone she spoke to had looked genuinely clueless about finding a doll. The next day and the next, she'd gotten to the rest of the building's inhabitants. She'd learnt the eighth unanswered door belonged to an empty unit. At 1.45am the next morning, she'd picked the lock to the empty apartment and checked for Ella there. Not, no doll. Delilah was beginning to have a problem that went beyond being awakened at 1.35am every night. The thing was that she wasn't just waking up every night at 1.35am, she was being terrorised every night at 1.35am. Every single night, some sound or smell or sensation stole into her sleep and wrestled her back into wakefulness, and now for the first time in her life she was having trouble sleeping at all. This problem had two prongs. First, she was having trouble getting to sleep at the start of her night. Instead of feeling the stress ooze out of her body when she hit the bed, as it always had in the past, now when she lay down her stress multiplied exponentially. As soon as her head touched the pillow, she had a sense of impending doom. It felt like the heart, uh, her heart was bouncing around in her chest. She began sweating and trembling. Her throat got tight. She alternately uh, felt frigid and then steaming hot. In spite of how fast her heart was beating, she couldn't catch her breath. On the second night of this, which was the 15th night of the entire ordeal, Delilah called Harper. I think I'm going to die, she told her friend. Talk to me, Harper said. You have two minutes. I'm about to go on. Oh, sorry. One minute, 55 seconds. Talk. Delilah described what she was experiencing. You're having a panic attack. What's been going on lately? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Try me. But do it in a minute. Delilah gave Harper the abbreviated version of her 1.35am torture. Why are you making such a big deal out of it? So you're waking up at the same time every night? Just go back to sleep. You don't understand. Apparently not. Try again tomorrow. Harper hung up. When the stage called, that was that. Left on her own again, Delilah looked up panic attacks on her computer. She discovered a variety of suggestions for dealing with them. Deep breathing, muscle relaxation, deliberate focus, visualisation of a happy place. Delilah focused on the first two, and she managed to fall asleep, only to be awakened at 1.35am by the sound of her deadbolt being thrown back. Launching herself from her bed, she bounded through her apartment to stop her intruder, but no one was intruding. Her deadbolt was secure, and her panic returned. This brought her to the second prong of her sleep problem. Ella's nightly incursions into Delilah's sleep left Delilah feeling violated and petrified. 
She was literally quivering by the time whatever it was that woke her faded back into silence. She had to use the same deep breathing and muscle relaxation to get back to sleep, and they seemed to be losing effectiveness. But still Delilah tried. Lying on her back now, she counted her breaths in and out. She was up to 254 before she started feeling even a little drowsy. Somewhere around 273, she finally went back to sleep. So you think this doll is, what, haunting you? Harper asked. She sipped her espresso and flipped around her long high ponytail, which went well with the 50s style, full skirted floral dress she had on today. No, not haunted, Delilah said. She's not a ghost, she's not possessed or whatever, she's technology. I think she's got the de defective programming. And she's what, invincible? Uh, so, uh, sorry, invisible? Got the keys to your deadbolt, able to walk through walls? Harper threw up her hands and the multitude of bracelets around her thin wrists jangled. I mean, there's technology and then there's magic. What you're talking about goes a little beyond technology, don't you think? Especially for an old doll. Delilah frowned and shook her head. It infuriated her that Harper was bringing up the very points that Delilah was hung up on herself. Her theory didn't make sense, but what other theories were there? Have you looked into the meaning of the number itself? Harper asked. She looked over at the counter and winked at a cute guy ordering a latte. Returning her attention to Delilah, she said, Maybe your subconscious is trying to tell you something. You mean like the 333 thing? Harper shrugged. Every number has a meaning. A resonance. Uh-huh. For as long as Delilah had known Harper, she'd been a little out there. I'm a right-brained free spirit. Delilah, uh, Harper said the first time Delilah had laughed at one of Harper's spiritual flights of fancy. Deal with it. I'm not kidding. Let's see. Harper pulled her phone from her pocket and tapped it a few times. Okay, here it is. Oh, hey, this, this is interesting. She looked up. I don't care, Delilah said. I don't want to know. I don't believe in that stuff anyway. Harper shrugged. Whatever. It's your funeral. That night, deep breathing didn't help Delilah get to sleep. After an hour of lying in her bed, exhausted but still too panicked to sleep, she sat up, grabbed her pillow and her comforter, and went out to the living room. There, she curled up on the sofa, tucked the comforter around her, and was asleep in a few more breaths. She was asleep until something started crawling on the ceiling above her. Delilah's eyes sprang open. She clawed for her flashlight, pushed the button, and aimed it at the ceiling. Delilah fully expected to see Ella clinging to the ceiling over her head. She could even hear fingernails rasping against drywall. Oh, I hate that thought. <laughs> Makes me cringe to the, to the, the sound. Um, but nothing was there, nothing at all. Delilah shined the flashlight around all over the ceiling and she listened. Stiffening, she pointed her light at the corner of the ceiling where it sounded like something was scrabbling toward the wall. Delilah squinted as if doing so would help her see through the opaque structures of her apartment. Of course, squinting didn't help, and neither did sleeping on the sofa. The sofa didn't keep Ella from tugging Delilah from her sleep at 1.35am the next night, either. But it did seem to help Delilah get back to sleep. It was only after the strange snicking sound retreated to the kitchen that Delilah was able to slow her breathing enough to find sleep again. The next night, though, the sofa had nothing to offer her. First, it took her just as long to get to sleep on the sofa as it had been taking in her bed. Second, the sofa couldn't soothe her after she felt the light touch on her shoulder at 1.35am. This time Delilah was awakened. She didn't have to turn on a light when she woke up. She'd never turned the lights out. The fact that Delilah didn't see Ella as soon as Delilah opened her eyes gave Delilah a clue about just how advanced her nemesis was. Ella could disappear in the blink, or the opening of an eye. Delilah knew Ella had disappeared that fast because the doll had been there. She, just, she had to have been there. Something touched Delilah. The touch had been baby soft, Ella soft, little fingers, just a hint of a brush against Delilah's nightshirt covered shoulder. No more than a hint of contact, but it had been enough to turn Delilah's intestines into a tangled mess, mass of fear and transform her blood into liquid nitrogen. 
She felt like she was being frozen and broken apart from within. Delilah stood, clenching her comforter and her pillow. She couldn't stay out here in the living room. She looked around like a gazelle, searching for a place the lion couldn't reach. Her gaze landed on the bathroom door. She ran for the little room and dove, uh, sorry, and dove <laughs> with her comforter and pillow into the bathtub. Curling into the tightest ball she could manage, she pulled the comforter over her head. What is a comforter? Is it a blanket? I don't know if it's like an American word. Like pacifier is, I know is like dummy and British, but it's kind of weird. Um, <laughs> the next night, Delilah started in the bathtub and still Ella found her. At 1.35am, Delilah heard something creeping through the pipes under the tub. Sure Ella's hand was going to bust through the porcelain and grab her, Delilah had scrambled out of the tub and into the corner of the bathroom, against the door, where she spent the next four hours trying to breathe. She didn't even attempt to sleep. At 5.35am, Delilah got dressed and went over to the diner. Nate, as she knew he would be, was baking biscuits and cinnamon rolls. What are you doing here? He asked when she stepped into the kitchen. I thought putting you on the same shift all the time had eliminated your time confusion. Now you're showing up for shifts you're not even you're not on instead of being late for the ones you are on. Nate chopped biscuit dough into neat squares and began throwing them into perfectly straight lines on a mas massive baking sheet. The diner smelled gloriously ordinary. Coffee aromas mingled with the scents of buttermilk and cinnamon. The sounds were comforting, comfortingly normal. Two, a couple of their early regulars were discussing the weather at the counter. One of the servers was whistling. The walk-in refrigerator hummed. I need you to put me on nights, Delilah said to Nate. Nate stopped in mid-throw. He turned and raised both eyebrows. You messing with me? Delilah shook her head. I'm having trouble sleeping at night. It's, well, it's a thing. I figure if I work nights, I can sleep during the day. I know Grace hates managing the night shift. She'd be happy to trade with me, I'm sure. You're a better manager. I like having you here when it's busy. Thanks. That wasn't a compliment. It was a statement of fact and, and a compliment. Uh, and a com <laughs> it wasn't a compliment. It was a compliment uh, and a complaint. You're just a teddy bear under all that bluster, Delilah said. It was true. Nate complained about every employee and every customer in the diner in general, and he loved them all. You tell anyone and I'll have to kill you. Delilah mimed, zipping her mouth shut. Nate sighed. Okay, switch. But do what you can to work out the thing. Thanks. Be here at 10 and do not be late. I'm going to buy two new alarm clocks right now. Good girl. <laughs> this can only go downward. <laughs> you know, if she's awake when the alarm goes off. Oh no. Delilah didn't know why she didn't think of it before. How could Ella plague Delilah at 1.35am if Delilah was already awake at that time? Exactly. There was no way Ella could sneak up on Delilah at the restaurant, so all Delilah had to do was work nights until Ella ran out of juice or whatever. Problem solved. Even though Delilah had never liked the night shift when she'd worked it before, she was so buoyed by her plan to be free of Ella that she went to work in the best mood she'd been in for a long time. She was so upbeat when she clocked in at 9.55pm that Glenn, the night shift cook, asked her if she was alright. Freedom, Glenn, she said. This is what freedom looks like. Weird is what you look like, he said. But he grinned to let her know he didn't hold it against her. Glenn was a huge guy with a gut that sometimes caught fire when he hung it over the grill. It spite of, in spite of his size, he was energetic. She thought he was pretty young, maybe in his late twenties. He had a baby face, chin length sideburns and kind brown eyes. She liked working with him. For three hours and 39 minutes, Delilah felt great. She chatted with all the late night regulars, letting a couple of the old guys flirt with her. She didn't even mind the couples, the ones who came in after the late shows, the ones who used to make her feel desperately alone. At 1.34am, Delilah stepped into the walk-in refrigerator to grab some cheese and some lettuce. For some reason, salads were popular tonight. She was just bending over to reach for the cheddar when she heard an alarm going off in the kitchen. Rising up, she whacked her head on the shelf above her. Uh, she ignored the pain and looked at her watch. It was 1.35am. Tearing out of the walk-in, Delilah spun in a circle in the kitchen. Where's that coming from? She shouted. 
Glenn looked up from the grill. Jackie, the night server, dropped the plate and stared at Delilah with wide blue eyes. Where's that coming from? Glenn asked. That! The alarm was similar to the torture device that Gerald had used. It had that same ringing, buzzing, shrieking undulation. <laughs> undulation. Uh, Delilah ran to the deep fryer and looked at its controls. No, it wasn't going off. She checked the ovens. They weren't even being used. She tore into the employee break room. No, the sound wasn't coming from in there. It was out in the kitchen. Delilah returned to the middle of the stainless steel maze and began searching through pots, pans and utensils. She didn't do it neatly or methodically, and when she tossed her third pan, Glenn grabbed her arm. Hey, Lady Delilah, you trippin'? What? Delilah rested her arm from Glenn's grasp. No, don't you hear? The sound stopped. Delilah tilted her head and listened, but all she could hear now were the normal diner vo uh, noises. She looked at Glenn and at Jackie, who was still staring like Delilah had just turned into an elephant. You two didn't hear that? She asked. Heard you shouting and throwing pans around, Glenn said. Delilah looked at Jackie. A year or two younger than Delilah and still unsure of herself, Jackie wore bright blue glasses. The lenses made her eyes look huge with shock. Jackie shook her head. I didn't hear anything. I mean, um, other than um, you and the usual um, stuff. This couldn't be happening. How could Ella have followed Delilah over here? Well, why couldn't she follow Delilah over here? Hadn't Ella already demonstrated she could do pretty much whatever she wanted? Which was crazy. This was just technology gone awry, right? You gonna be okay? Glenn asked. Delilah shook her head. Yeah. And she figured she would be. At least she didn't have to try to go to sleep with her heart pounding so loudly she was sure Glenn and Jackie could hear it and were just being too polite to say so. So her plan hadn't worked, but the upside was she could use her adrenaline-driven energy surge for her work instead of trying to fight it so she could go to sleep. And maybe tomorrow night, because she was prepared for the alarm sound now, she could ignore it and get on with her shift. Maybe her new plan would work after all. On the second night shift, Delilah made sure she wasn't alone at 1.35am. She stuck close to Glenn, which he didn't seem to mind, but in spite of being with him, she still lost it. She couldn't help it. Tonight, for the first time, she hadn't just heard or sensed anything. Uh, sorry, she hadn't just heard or sensed something. She'd seen something. She'd seen a flash of bright blue in the walk-in when Jackie opened the door. When she saw what she was sure was Ella coming out of the walk-in, Delilah screamed and pressed against Glenn. He didn't seem to mind that either, but he did ask why she was screaming. She had no answer for him. At 1.30am, the third night of Delilah's switch to night shift, Delilah was behind the counter. She had decided the way to make sure nothing spooked her tonight was to stay out here in the open, well away from the walk-in. When Mrs. Jeffrey, the rice pudding regular, came into the diner, Delilah was thrilled. She could serve Mrs. Jeffrey in 1.35am would just go on by. Hi Delilah. Mrs. Jeffrey took a seat on one of the swiveling padded counter stools. Her eyes were puffy. Delilah leaned in on the counter. Hi Mrs. Jeffrey. Having trouble sleeping? Mrs. Jeffrey patted her ta uh, tussled hair. I suppose it's obvious. I do hope you still have some rice pudding left. Absolutely, I'll just... Delilah stopped. She looked over her shoulder. Then she glanced at the clock. It was 1.33am. Where was Jackie? No way did Delilah want to go back into the walk-in. She was sure Ella would be, waiting, uh, would be in there waiting for her. Jackie? She called. No answer. Jackie! It came out as a bellow. Glenn st stuck his head out of the kitchen. Is there a problem? Delilah tried to calm her breathing. She was building up to a full-blown anxiety attack and she didn't want to have one of those in front of her customer and co-workers. Delilah looked at Mrs. Jeffrey. The elderly woman's brown eyes were wide. Sorry, Delilah said. It's just... She stopped when the counter stool next to Mrs. Jeffrey started spinning back and forth. She blinked and she realised Ella was on the stool. Ella was playing on the stool. Stop it! Delilah clampered over the counter and grabbed the stool. That's when Jackie entered the dining room. 
Delilah glanced at Jackie and realised she was sprawled over the counter, her butt up in the air. No wonder Jackie was gawking at her, open-mouthed. Are you alright, dear? Mrs. Jeffrey asked. Delilah slid off the counter. You didn't see the doll on the stool? Doll? That's my purse, dear. Mrs. Jeffrey patted a bright blue purse which sat on the stool next to her. Delilah backed away from the counter. She checked the clock. Of course, it was 1.35am. The next night, something similar happened. Delilah stayed in the dining room, but she was still traumatised at 1.35am. When she saw something moving around in the trash bin under the counter, wanting to believe it was a mouse, um, even though that would have been horrible for the diner, she'd used a fork to search the rubbish. She didn't find a mouse, but she spotted a pink ruffle that made her drop the fork and jump back. She'd resisted the urge to scream, but she hadn't been able to resist the urge to hurl the trash bin out the back door of the diner, scattering trash but no Ella, who, as usual, had instantly moved on, all over the pavement. Delilah just couldn't contain her reactions. She knew Glenn and Jackie were watching her, but that wasn't enough to keep her calm. It was the fifth night of night, of night shift uh, that did Delilah in. Even though it hadn't worked so well yet, Delilah still thought the safest place for her in the diner was the main dining room. She did her best to avoid closed-in places like the walk-in, the supply room and Nate's office. At 1.30am on the fifth night, the diner was empty of customers. Delilah and Jackie were filling the small glass salt and pepper containers. Delilah had salt, Jackie had paper. They had the tray of containers set up at a table by the diner's front window and they sat on opposite sides of the table. While they worked, Jackie chatted about her college classes. Delilah tried to pay attention but she was mentally counting down the minutes and seconds to 1.35am. What was it going to be tonight? Every muscle and joint in Delilah's body was stiff with dread. But when Delilah spotted something bright blue flutter through the parking lot in front of the diner, her muscles and joints released and went into action. She jumped up, knocking the tray of salt and pepper shakers onto the floor with a loud crash, and she sprinted out the diner's front door. Rushing through the nearly empty parking lot, she scanned for Ella's dress. She was sure that that was what she had seen. She had seen the trailing edge of Ella's fluffy dress. The doll was out here. She had been watching Delilah. When she didn't see Ella, Delilah started looking under the two parked cars at the edge of the lot. She was bending to check under the first one when someone grabbed her shoulder. She screamed. Okay, okay, you're okay. It was Glenn. His face looked pale in the mottled light. Did you see her? Delilah asked. See who? She looked into Glenn's eyes. He was so sympathetic and concerned. Delilah crumpled into Glenn's arms and started to cry. Delilah thought it was pretty amazing she'd gotten through 23 nights of 1.35am horror without crying. In fact, she hadn't even noticed that she didn't cry. But once she started crying, she couldn't stop. She cried so much that after Glenn got her inside, he called Nate and asked him to come in. Nate arrived as Jackie was sweeping up broken glass from the diner floor. While Delilah sat in the back booth and tried to get her body to stop twitching, Nate talked to Glenn and Jackie. She couldn't hear what they said, but she figured she should say something on her own behalf. She stood. Come with me, Nate stead, uh, said. Good, he was taking her to his office. She could explain things there, or not. As soon as they entered his office, Nate closed the door behind him. I'm sorry, Delilah. I have to let you go. Delilah looked at Nate with wide eyes that felt bruised and lacerated. Don't look at me like that. Nate went around his desk and dropped into his leather chair. Delilah twisted her mouth and tried not to whimper. I've cut you all kinds of slack for being late. I've worked around your thing, but this is too much. Jackie says you've been acting super weird. He gave the words, air quotes, the last four nights. And now this. I can't keep an employee who freaks out the customers and breaks trays full of salt and pepper shakers. Nate, I don't, don't even try to give me a sob story. I'm not your father. Whatever you have going on that made, okay, oh, that made you do what you did tonight is something you need to work on on your own. Outside this diner. You're a good worker when you're here and focused, but I can't afford the liability risks of you acting like this. He rubbed his beard. I'll have someone bring you your last check tomorrow. 
Delilah stood in front of Nate's scarred old desk and looked at it, at, at all its neat little piles. She turned. She wasn't going to beg, beg for the job. As she left the diner, she wasn't even thinking about the job. She was thinking about Ella. Every night was getting worse. How was she going to get through another 1.35am? Sheesh. <clears throat> When Richard had asked Delilah to move out of his parents' guest house, she'd had no place to go, so she'd gone to Harper. Harper welcomed her with open arms, but unfortunately Harper lived in a house with ten other struggling actors. All Harper had to offer was half of a double-sized bed mattress on the floor of what once was a massive walk-in closet. Massive for a closet, not so much for a place to sleep. Harper loved her retreat. She got the bed and she got to organise all her clothes on the racks and shelves of the closet. Delilah ha hated the tiny space. It gave her claustrophobia. Plus, Harper snored and talked in her sleep. Delilah had only stayed with Harper three days before getting her apartment with the money Richard had given her. So it had said a lot about her state of mind that she called Harper when she got home from work and asked if she could stay with Harper for a few nights. Sure thing, Harper said. We'll have a slumber party. You won't even know 1.35am has come and gone. Delilah wanted to believe that was true. She tried to believe it. Harper was performing that evening, as she did six evenings a week. So she left uh, Delilah in the care of one of her, flat, of her housemates, a funky guy named Rudolph, who, <laughs> who had a red nose, who spent the afternoon and evening teaching Delilah the card game he created. She never did fully understand it, but she had to admit it was entertaining. Rudolph was funny and nice too. By the time Harper got home at about... 12.30 a.m., Delilah was surprisingly relaxed. Okay, Harper said, dragging Delilah away from a disappointed Rudolph. You don't get to keep her as a pet, Rudy. She chastised. <laughs> um, he stuck out his lower lip, then grinned at Delilah as Delilah followed Harper to the second floor of his house. I have munchies, Harper said. The salty kind, guaranteed to keep away snarky high-tech dolls. Delilah's stomach did a somersault at the, world, at the word doll. Harper led Delilah into a bedroom, threw several bags of boxes of chips and crackers on the mattress, then said, I need to go wash off the face paint. Be right back. Delilah sat on the mattress, opened a box of cheese crackers and nibbled on one. Her stomach continued to do gymnastics. When Harper returned, she entertained Delilah with stories about that evening's performance. So first, Manny forgot his line, and then he said, my line, Harper said as she tore into a bag of barbecue potato chips. Imbecile. I had to think fast, so I kissed him. Was that in character? My character's a bit of a doodle bug, so pretty much anything's in character. Delilah looked at her watch. It was 12.55am. Hey, did you just look at your watch? Harper grabbed Delilah's arm. Give me that! Delilah didn't resist when Harper took off Delilah's watch and stuffed it under a pillow. She didn't need it anyway, she'd know when 1.35am came. No watch, no 1.35am. Harper wiped her hands in a that's that gesture. Delilah wanted it to be that easy, but it wasn't. She knew exactly when 1.35am rolled around. She knew because suddenly a voice said, it's time. Delilah jumped up and hit her head on the rack above the bed. What are you doing? Harper asked at the same time Delilah ducked her head under the rack and said, Did you do that? Then they both spoke at the same time again. What do you mean? Delilah said. Do what? Harper said. They both stopped. Delilah could hear, uh, could still hear Gerald's voice in her ear repeating, It's time in a receding echo. Delilah looked down at Harper. Do you hear that? Harper frowned up at Delilah. I don't hear anything except rules oldies music and the movie Kate and Julia are watching downstairs. You didn't just mimic Gerald? I'm sitting right here in front of you. I'm eating potato chips. How could I have mimicked Gerald? Harper popped a chip into her mouth with deliberate emphasis. She chewed loudly. Delilah shook her head. She realised she was shivering. She had to clench her teeth together to keep them from chattering. Then you must have Ella. What? Delilah's neck was starting to hurt from her contorted position under the closet rack, and her legs felt weak. She sank onto the bed. You know what Gerald sounds like. So? So you could program Ella to sound like him, record yourself mimicking him or something. 
Harper shoved aside the chips bag and leaned toward Delilah. I want to be sure I'm understanding what you're saying, she narrowed her eyes. You're saying I took your wacky doll and somehow got her to work and I recorded my impression of Gerald on the doll so it could play that for you. That's what you're saying? Delilah shook her head. No? Harper asked. Then what are you saying? That is what I'm saying. I'm just... You're just crazy, is what you're just. I... I don't have the stupid doll. I never saw the stupid doll. If I had seen the doll and had taken the doll, I sure wouldn't have recorded something on it to scare you. Why would I do that? I don't know. Delilah looked at her hands. She felt a little stupid. Why would Harper do that? Then she remembered the voice she heard. But who else could have done it? You tell me, Delilah said. Why did you do it? I didn't do it. Harper shouted. Uh, sorry, I was very confused there. Um, <laughs> Delilah flinched. Then she whispered, But there's no other explanation. Harper stared at Delilah. Jeez, Del, you're losing it. Girl. <laughs> she shoved the junk food off the bed and curled up on her side with her back to Delilah. I'm going to sleep. I wish I could. You could, Harper said. Just get out of your head. It's not me, it's Ella. Harper sighed and started breathing deeply and evenly. Must be nice. Delilah muttered. The next day, Delilah spent most of her day hanging out with Harper and her, and her housemates because she didn't fall asleep until almost 7am and Harper woke her up when she got up at about 10am. Delilah was fuzzy with sleep deprivation. She felt like someone had stuffed her brain with cotton candy. When she got up, Harper seemed either to have forgotten Delilah's accusations or forgiven them. She didn't say anything about what happened between them and she was... Uh, she was her usual vivacious uh, self all day. I don't know what that me word means. Delilah decided not to say anything else about the Ella. She also decided, though, that she wasn't staying here tonight. She'd leave while Harper was at the theatre. She didn't know until she walked out her car at 4.35pm where she was going to go. It came to her in a flash of brilliant insight. She'd go to a motel, a motel on the other side of the town. Ella wouldn't be able to find her there. Delilah didn't think anyone else, like Harper, would find her there either. She wasn't going to use an assumed name or anything, but Harper didn't process things in the sort of organised way that she'd think she'd, uh, to do a search of motels and find out if her friend was staying there. So at 6.15pm, after Delilah ate a burger and fries at a fast food place, she checked into the bed for you motel on the outskirts of the scuff sc uh, scruffier side of town. The quality level of the hotel was evident in both its name and the fact that it was a fading sign announced a bed and a TV in every room. Talk about luxury, uh, Delilah said when she parked her cars over her cars, her car over weeds growing through cracks in the time-worn asphalt. The price was right though. Trying not to breathe in smells of bleach and stewed cabbage in the hotel's small brown lobby, Delilah paid for three nights. She was happy that the total barely made a dent in the credit limit on her one credit card. She was also happy that she got a room at the far end of the long, low building in the back, away from the traffic. The heavy woman behind the desk wasn't interested in Delilah at all. She was too busy watching a documentary about spiders on an old TV mounted on the wall next to the check-in counter. The old hotel room was surprisingly neat and clean. Done in the same ugly brown tones Delilah had found in the lobby, the room wouldn't win any beauty prizes, but it smelled fresh and everything worked. The bed was even comfortable. Because the only other surfaces in the room suitable for sitting were a couple of straight-backed, cloth-covered chairs, Delilah plopped on the bed as soon as she bolted the door and set her stuff on the low bureau across from the bed. Uh, she was pleased to discover the motel was pretty well insulated. The traffic on the busy road in front of the motel was just a distant shh, and Delilah couldn't hear anything else. She thought she might watch some TV when she got in the room, but she was so tired and she risked and she risked lying back on the pillow, tense, expecting the usual panic attack. Uh, a panic attack symptoms. She was thrilled when she felt nothing but exhaustion. She closed her eyes, and sleep took her from the motel room into the promise or portent of her dreams. The sound crept through her sleep like a spider crawling through her synapses and leaving silken trails along her neuropathways. That's such a good sentence. Uh, it was a scuffing sound, like something scooting over a rough surface. 
her mind couldn't make sense uh, make enough sense of it to integrate it into her dream about riding horses so she so the horse in her dream threw her off and she became face to face with the spider she screamed and the scream slung her back into consciousness Delilah's eyes opened and she realized she was still screaming. She pressed her lips together and bit her tongue. She wanted to get up and run, but she couldn't. She was paralyzed. Wait, was she awake? She thought she was. Above her, something crawled on the roof. It made a similar sound to the one in her dream, but this sound was worse. It wasn't just the sound of some spider going about its business. This was a strategic sound. It started, it stopped, it moved here, it moved there. It was a searching sound, a seeking sound. It was the sound of something with an objective. And Delilah knew she was the objective. Ella had found Delilah. She was looking for a way into the motel room, whining like a kitten being hunted by a coyote. Um, Delilah struggled to free her limbs from whatever force held her immobile. But she was still pinned to the bed. The only thing she could do was move her head. So she turned her head and looked at the digital clock on the bedside table. It read, of course, 1.35am. As soon as Delilah saw the time, she discovered she could move. She thrashed free of the bedspread, which she'd managed to wrap around herself in her sleep. She jumped from the bed and crouched against the wall by the door, she, her gaze riveted on the ceiling. Flashing dark red light from a neon sign next door to the motel splayed across the ceiling like blood splatter. It was sporadically illuminated by the flickering fluorescent lamps that lit up the motel walkways and parking lot. This meant Delilah could see what she needed to see. Nothing was coming through the ceiling, but that didn't comfort her. Ella had other ways to get into the room, and even if she didn't get into the room, the very fact that she was outside of the room on the roof meant that Delilah's brief respite was over. There was no getting away from Ella. Delilah began rocking back and forth like a child and she hummed until daylight broke. She didn't know what she was humming at first, but then she recognised the tune. She was humming the old lullaby her mum used to sing to her when she was little. Even though Delilah had paid for three nights, she left the motel room about noon the next day. There was no point in staying. She couldn't sleep. She wasn't safe there. She was pretty sure she wasn't safe anywhere, but Delilah, uh, but Delilah figured being mobile wasn't a bad idea. This assumed though that Ella's circuits hadn't noted the make, model, colour and maybe even the license plate of Delilah's car. Ella had, after all, ridden to the apartment in the car. She probably had left some sort of tracker in it. Delilah's travels were no doubt a pointless waste of time and gasoline. But what else could Delilah do? So she drove. She drove all afternoon and all evening. She drove all over the city exploring neighbourhoods she hadn't known existed. She gazed longingly at big family homes and children playing in the park. She cruised the shopping district, remembering what it was like to be able to buy whatever she wanted, and also remembering how little pleasure that had given her. She'd never wanted things, she'd wanted love. When the sun started going down a little after six, Delilah realised she was being stupid, very stupid. Why was she staying in the city? Why not get out of town, drive out onto the country? Wouldn't it be harder for Ella to reach her there? Delilah turned at a busy corner and pointed her car toward the freeway. Then she immediately turned again, looping back into the neighbourhood she'd just left. Maybe she wasn't being stupid after all. What if the city was helping to keep her safe? What if Ella would be free to do whatever she wanted to do uh, to Delilah if they were away from a populated area? Besides, in the country it was dark, very dark. Delilah had only one small flashlight. She didn't think she could stand facing 1.35am in the pitch dark. No. She'd stay in town. But where? Pulling into the drive through of a fast food burrito place, Delilah bought a chicken and rice burrito with sour cream. Weirdly, even though she was so scared she was probably just one more shock from full-blown hysteria, she still had her appetite. Maybe her body knew she needed nutrition to handle what was coming her way. Delilah ate her burrito at a drive-in movie theatre and she discovered uh, sorry, a movie theatre she discovered on the west edge of the city. She had no idea it was there. She was happy to find it, though. It had kept her awake until nearly midnight. That's when the last movie, a chase scene heavy action flick, ended and Delilah had to join the ragged line of cars straggling out of the drive-in. That's when she had to decide where she should be when 135 came around. She'd thought about parking her car behind a dark building or in a quiet neighbourhood near an, occupied, an unoccupied house. 
But did she really want to make it that easy for Ella to get to her? No, it would be better if she was driving around at 1.35am. She'd never tried that before. Maybe that was the trick. No, you're going to crash. <laughs> So as her limbs got more jittery and her breath came faster and her lungs got tighter, Delilah drove closer and closer to the city center. She wanted to be where people uh, still meandered down the sidewalks and bright lights turned night into day. At 1.33 a.m., Delilah had an even more inspired idea. She'd drive onto one of the big bridges. Surely Ella couldn't get her to her there, especially since the decision to hit the on-ramp onto the bridge was as spontaneous as you could get. Even though it was the middle of the night, at least a dozen cars were on the bridge. Delilah's hands sweated and she repositioned them on the steering wheel. She blinked several times to clear her vision, which was becoming blurry. She concentrated on the road and forced herself not to look at her dashboard digital clock. But she knew when 1.35am arrived. Ooh. <laughs> she knew because that's when she heard her passenger door open, uh, unlock and unlatch. Gasping and losing control of the car for an instant, Delilah turned the wheel to get back in her lane. The whooshing sound of wind coming through the open passenger door hit her just before she heard the passenger door slam closed again. She glanced to her right, her whole body charged with terror. She fully expected to see Ella sitting in the car next to her, but nothing was there. All she saw in the car was a bag of fast food trash, her purse and her flashlight. Almost across the bridge, she put her gaze back on the road. Then something hit the roof of her car with a thunk. Delilah screamed and jammed her foot onto the accelerator. Her car scooted forward and she pulled out to pass a minivan, barely missing its back bumper. She then jerked her car back into the right lane so she could take the first exit off the bridge. Driving like a mad woman, Delilah careened into or onto the industrial road running parallel to the river and pulled over when she reached a boarded up factory. Her car skidded to a stop, spraying gravel. Delilah had the engine off and was out of the car the minute the vehicle stopped moving. She didn't bother to lock it up. She just grabbed her purse and her flashlight, slammed the driver's door behind her and ran. She ran toward the river behind the factory, her feet crackling over crumbling concrete and trash. She ran until she was hidden from the road. Her car was no longer in sight either. Delilah could still see where she was going because the factory, though empty, was well lit. She stopped running and looked around. She had no idea where she was, but she didn't feel safe. Where would she ever feel safe again? Turning in a full circle, she scanned her surroundings. Maybe if she could hide from Ella now, the doll wouldn't find her later. But where could she hide? Delilah spotted a drainage pipe at the far side of the factory. It was huge, maybe four feet in diameter. She could crawl into that easily. Striding across a dirt and gravel lot filled with potholes, Delilah headed toward the drainage pipe, but halfway there she stopped. She couldn't take her purse with her. She couldn't take anything with her. She didn't know what linked her to Ella. Turning into another circle, um, Delilah saw a stack of railroad ties. That should work. She checked her surroundings again. She was still alone. She ran over to the railroad ties and hid her purse in a crevice. Then she looked around once more and bolted over to the drainage pipe. She crawled inside and hunkered down. She realized she was lightheaded. She was hyperventilating. Leaning over her head between her knees, she attempted to shorten her breaths, taking in less oxygen than she was sure she needed. She wished she had a paper bag. There was one in the car, but she couldn't go back there. She couldn't go back to any place she'd ever been before. She couldn't go back to her life. Ella was going to find her anywhere, even here. Delilah fell back onto her butt and curled up in a ball, hugging her legs close. She tried to stay silent, but she couldn't. She began to keen. The sound that came from her wasn't like any sound she'd made before. Not even when her parents died. Not even when her first foster home refused to keep her. Not even when her fourth foster dad beat her, not even when Gerald scheduled when she could blow her nose, not even when Richard threw her out. The sound contained every hurt and fear and crushing disappointment she'd ever had, all rolled into one screeching rejection of pain. The sound she made was the sound of a woman who had no strength left. She couldn't fight anymore. Delilah closed her mouth. Her throat hurt. Her lungs hurt. Her heart hurt. And she couldn't stop quaking. 
Her whole body was almost convulsing with apprehension. No, not apprehension. Delilah was so far beyond any known version of fear that she didn't feel human anymore. She was never going to be safe again. Delilah sobbed as she got onto her hands and knees. She couldn't stay here. Ella would know where she was. Crawling as fast as she could, her hands stinging th from the rough concrete surface, chafing at her skin, Delilah cram uh, clambered out of the drainage pipe. She stood. Where could she go? Delilah began to run again. She ran parallel to the river, scanning this way and that, looking for a way out, looking for an escape hatch, an ejection seat, something to take her as far from Ella as she could get. She didn't know how long she ran before she stumbled into what looked like an abandoned construction site. Its lumpy outlines were shrouded by the darkness, but street lamps sent enough light over it to reveal its basic outlines. She slowed her pace, aimed her flashlight, and studied the weathered sign announcing the project. It looked like an office complex. Shoving at a dirty board covering an opening in the, wet, uh, in the side of what seemed to be a three-story structure, Delilah side, sidled, or siddled into the, uh, yeah, sidled, uh, sidled into the site. The answer to her plight was in here. She was sure of it. Someplace here, she was going to find a way to escape Ella forever. But where? Picking her way over bare boards sprinkled with nails and screws, weaving around stacks of lumber and drywall, Delilah made her way into a room that was nearly completed. The drywall wasn't just up, it was also textured and painted, and there, high up on the inside wall, was her answer. It was a vent opening, uncovered, barely big enough for her to slip into. That was the way. That was where she could stop running from Ella. Looking around the room for a way to boost herself in, up into the building, uh, up, up to the opening, she spotted an overturned sawhorse. She trotted over to it, righted it, and carried it to a spot below the vent. It was strong and stable. Stopping to listen, to be sure she was alone, Delilah hoisted herself uh, onto the seahorse, uh, seahorse, onto the sawhorse, stood on her tiptoes, and was able to hook her hands over the front of the vent opening. From there, she did a pull up, thankful for the upper body strength she got from the cl heavy cleaning at the diner. Once her head was level with the vent opening, she reached in with one arm, searching for some kind of handhold. She couldn't find one. Uh, didn't find one, sorry, but her sweaty hand stuck to the metal enough to give her some purchase. She was able to wiggle her upper body into the vent opening by going one hand length at a time. Once she was that far into the vent, she just had to wiggle her whole body like a snake into the vent. But she didn't feel safe. She stopped wriggling for a moment, taking stock. Turning on the flashlight, she spotted a downward turn in the vent. She inched toward it. That, yes, this was it. Aiming her head down the chute-like space, she scooted forward, a little further, and a little further. Her flashlight slipped from her sweaty hand and clinked against the metal vent walls as it dropped out of uh, Delilah's reach. She heard it impact something with a sharp crack. It must have broken because the space went dark. Delilah's shoulders wedged her so tightly into the compact metal enclosure that she knew she'd finally found it. This was where Ella couldn't find her. No one would find her here. Trying to move just to be sure, she confirmed that she was stuck, completely and thoroughly stuck. <laughs> uh, her breathing slowed. She relaxed. She couldn't move in any direction. She'd never have to run from Ella again. And there we go. That's 1.35am. <laughs> oh, I... It's 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 an alright story. It's alright. I think it goes on for a bit too long. I think it 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 just it goes on for for a bit too long. But um, I think it's it's still good nevertheless. I think it's what's the third story in this book? The new kid. I think it's like the weakest of the three, but it's still pretty good. I I quite like this story. Um, it's it, the tension builds. And it builds and it builds and it gets worse and worse. And just the ending is quite chilling as well. Uh, I remember first reading through this story and I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> that's the end of the story. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, it's it's weird. Um, but I hope you enjoyed. Uh, I definitely enjoyed uh, this story. 
Uh, but what do you think? Any theories on what this is about? Um, I will say this comes into play a lot with the Stitch Raid Stingers. So um, go and read, uh, go and read through that chronology if you want to find out how. <laughs> but yeah, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you in another audiobook. Goodbye.